he talked to, he stuck a microphone in his face and he said, welcome home soldier, what can we do for you? He said in prison, you never get enough to eat. And I would like to be able to eat until I'm not hungry anymore. The next one he stopped said, you never get to take a shower in prison. And he said, I want to be able to stand in a hot shower until I feel clean. The third one he stopped asking the usual question. He paused for a long moment and he looked straight into the camera and he said, I want to go home. I just want to go home.
thank you, Brother John. What a joy to have John sing these songs. You know, that, that song, Beulah Land, has become one of my favorites over the years. Our dear friend, <clears throat> Brother Gene Hughes, who I ministered with in my early years in ministry back in the late 80s. He was the associate pastor there at Lakeland Street Baptist Church when I was on staff, and him and I became really good friends. And he went up to Kansas to pastor, and he just died during the COVID pandemic about six months ago. His sweet wife has got COVID now for the second time, but she's doing okay. But he always loved that song, and every time he heard it, he was a very emotional, sensitive man. He would just begin to bawl. He'd just cry. It's such a beautiful song. Thank you for that, John. Well, take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. When you find your place, stand with me. Matthew chapter 4. Let's read some together. Matthew chapter number 4. And then we're going to read some verses out of the book of Acts again. And I want to speak to you on the subject, getting out of our comfort zones. Getting out of our comfort zones. Matthew 4, I'm going to begin in verse 18 and read just down through verse 20, and then we'll go to Acts chapter 1. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, or fishermen. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway or immediately at once left their nets and followed him. Now go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to give you a couple of verses through the book of Acts. Very similar to what I did last week in the message on our theme out of our fortress and on a mission. And this is going to be related to that theme. Notice Acts 1 beginning in verse 12. Acts 1 verse 12. Then, or, uh, yeah, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount of, uh, called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now again, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now go to chapter 11. Ahead in the book of Acts to chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 11. Verses 1 through 3. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, Jewish believers, contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. Now go down to verse 15. Verse 15, same chapter. And as I began to speak, here's Peter giving his uh, recollection of the story. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus, who or what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, chapter number 8, back to chapter 8. We'll finish with this one verse. We've read it a few times, but it's such a pivotal verse for our subject again. Verse 4, chapter 8, of, in verse 4 of the book of Acts. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Let's pray. God and Father, we humble ourselves before you and ask, dear God, that you would help us, especially in this difficult subject and task. Lord, we're all people of comfort. Uh, we like our comforts. We gravitate back to them all the time. But Lord, it's, it's your will that so many times by your Spirit to stir us out of our comfort zones. 
And Lord, our church needs to be stirred. I need to be stirred. God, I pray that you'll stir every one of our members to realize, Lord, that great things can only be accomplished as we get out of our comfort zones. Bless the message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Our nature as human beings is to seek comfort, ease and luxury, security. We speak of comfort foods and creature comforts. There's a chain of hotels called Comfort Inns. How many words think about that go along with the word comfort? We think of being comfortable, comforting, comforted, a comforter. So many synonyms are saying the same thing as the word comfort. Words like ease and solace and soothe and contentment, amenities, relaxation, euphoria, pleasure, and we can go on and on. Comfort in and of itself is not a bad word and it's not a wrong goal. Think about it, to comfort someone or to be comforted by someone is one of the greatest joys in life. One of the very titles for God's precious Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, is called the Comforter, the one who comes beside and, and helps us. But in man's fallen state, to desire comfort often becomes selfish and destructive. Laziness, greed, thinking that we'll find happiness in things often results in seeking comfort. So God's approach often to fallen mankind is to stir us out of our comfort zones. Think about how God did this so many times. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did God do? He cast them out of the garden. That was their comfort place. That was their home. They could not get back in after they left. I think of Moses who... During the second 40 years of his life, he's out in the Midianite desert. He's married. He's got two sons. I think he's living a comfortable life, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. He's living a quiet life, no worries. And all of a sudden, one day, God appears to him in a burning bush and says, I want you to go lead my people out of Egypt. Boy, that was out of his comfort zone. I think of David, the young man, probably a teenager at the time, who's been out probably for several years in charge of his father Jesse's sheep. He's playing his harp and singing songs out with the sheep out in the fields. And all of a sudden, one day, he's startled out of his, his comfort zone to say, Come, come see the prophet Samuel. Someone's going to be anointed king. From the time he was anointed king that day, his life would never be the same. I see that in the text I read for you in Matthew 4 and in the book of Acts. Here one day, Jesus comes by the Sea of Galilee and sees these brothers, Peter and Andrew. And the text goes on to say the same for James and John. They had been fishermen. That's what they did for a living. That's what they were comfortable with. They were out taking care of their nets and getting ready to go out again the next day, if you will. But all of a sudden, Jesus says, come follow me. And they left their nets, it says, and immediately went and followed him. All through the book of Acts, as I went through and saw with you these texts. First, the, the early church, 120 are meeting up in the upper room for prayer. And I mean, they're secluded. They're still afraid of their, uh, for their lives and they're keeping themselves in secret. But the very next chapter says, as they had met again in one place in one accord, suddenly came the Holy Spirit to stir them out of their comfort zone of prayer and of, of, of seclusion to go and preach. And Peter would stand up that day. Peter tells us the story in chapter 11 of a real shaking out of his comfort zone. Remember the early church made up of all Jews at first did never understand or believe that Gentiles would be added into God's plan not only for salvation but for service in His churches. And so Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. You know the whole story in chapter 10. Well when word gets back to the church of Jerusalem that he had went into the home of a Gentile a Roman centurion if you will worse than anything they are upset. They're, they're beside themselves. And they say, tell us what happened. How could you have done this? And Peter relates the story. And basically comes to the conclusion that it was God's will. Stirred them out of their comfort zone to reach the Gentiles. And then that climactic verse I read again in chapter 8 that always amazes me. After the church had spent those first few years, it appears, just in Jerusalem. They wouldn't go outside of the city. 
Jesus said you're to go to Samaria, or Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth, but they hadn't done any of that. They had stayed all in Jerusalem only. And so he sent the persecution that started by the stoning of Stephen, right? And it made them scatter. And it says they went everywhere preaching the word. And so, folks, this is the key to the church's success, getting out of our comfort zones. Part of our theme, and not just for this year, I don't want to just limit it to this year. It really should be the theme of our entire existence as a church. Out of our fortress and on a mission. One of the keys to that is going to be our willingness to do this very thing. To get out of our comfort zones. It may be the hardest thing we're going to have to do, but it is also one of the most necessary. Now, getting out of your comfort zone, out of my comfort zone, I know it's a little scary. It's a lot scary at times. Do you know what New Year's resolutions are all about? I won't even ask you how well you're doing on yours if you made any. Here we are 17 days into the new year. But you know what New Year's resolutions are about? They're really about comfort zones. Leaving something uh, that you've been doing that you figured out is not good for your life or starting something that you're not really comfortable doing but you know is going to be good for your life. That's what New Year's resolutions are about. Comfort zones can end up being default mechanisms. Things that we fall back on. And I have said this, I said it last week, I've said it several times leading up to today, that our church has got to be willing to get out of our comfort zones. We can't just stick with the status quo. We can't just have a mentality, let's not rock the boat. Many churches, and ours has fallen into this as well, it's just the easiest thing. We're all susceptible to just falling into the comfort zones of life. And for a church, it's easy for us to fall into our comfort zone. And yet, God is calling us out of that. He's calling us to higher ground, holy ground. Ground that God will go before us on and see us into. So, the message today is all about getting out of our comfort zones. Let me ask three questions in the message and try to answer them. Number one, what are our comfort zones? What does that mean to each of us? Well, let me give you some ideas so you can think through your comfort zones. I need to be able to identify mine. First of all, a comfort zone is a place that you go to feel secure. A place that you go to feel secure. It could be your home, of course. It could be your room in your home. It could be any place where you isolate yourself and get away from everything else. Do you know the church for Christians can be a comfort zone, huh? That's what I told you about a fortress. We're comfortable here. We know each other. We love each other, I hope. We're here to do the same thing. We're on the same page. It's easy to make this place our comfort zone. And comfort zones aren't all bad till they get out of balance. Till they get out of balance. There's nothing wrong with enjoying your home. There's nothing wrong with having a nice room to go to, to to have some peace and quiet, to sleep, to think, to read, whatever. Nothing wrong with coming to the church, of course. But if we get it out of balance, and that's all we do. When I was growing up, one of my favorite friends or their family were friends with my brother, and I'm older brother, and I hung around with this family. And they were, they were a lot of fun to hang around with us. We weren't Christians. We weren't living the Christian life. But uh, their mother, uh, we found out later. We didn't know this as kids. We always wondered about this. Their mother had some mental problems, and she would stay for months in her room, never come out of her room. And we didn't even for a long time know who she was. All of a sudden, one day she'd get better or just change her way of thinking or whatever. She'd pop out and she was nice and she'd give us snacks and bring us something to drink and watch us play around the yard. And then all of a sudden, we wouldn't see her again for months again. We'd say, what happened to your mom? Well, she's, she's not doing good or whatever. And I thought about how sad that was. That, you know, that, and I'm not saying I'm blaming her, but she had this comfort zone where she could only really get along in her own room. Think about the Amish. You know, the Amish, and I've always been intrigued by the Amish, um, they kind of got to where they decided to just stay to themselves, to themselves. Never go outside of their comfort zone of Amish life. Isn't that tragic? I was reading in just a secular uh, place about comfort zones, and a man said it this way. He says, how do you define your comfort zone? The dictionary says it's the place where you feel comfortable and your abilities are not being tested 
A second definition in the dictionary says, the comfort zone is the place where you don't have to do anything new or different. Boy, that's a pretty good definition, isn't it? So our comfort zones are places we go to feel secure. But secondly, it also a comfort zone can be things that we are good at or situations where we thrive in. Things that we're good at or situations where we thrive in. Think about if you have certain talents or abilities or experience in something. This becomes your comfort zone. These are our strengths, right? And it's very easy for us to stay only in our strengths and not even try to address our weaknesses. All of us have this problem. I think about someone who plays so beautifully as Shelly on that piano. You know, to Shelly, that's her comfort zone. She's good on that piano. She's, you know, I think of somebody like Lou baking. You know, Lou, that's her comfort zone. Lou, I mean, she's in her element when she's baking or cooking. That's, that's her element. I think of Cody. Cody, man, he gets up there and sings. He, he's in his element singing. You know, I have to say, and, and we've talked to our seminary students about this, after you preach for a number of years, you get comfortable. You know, I, I'm kind of in my comfort zone to be able to speak and teach and preach, but I have to be careful of that. See, strengths always have opposites which are weaknesses. And we have to be careful not to see those and to avoid those. So many of us do. A third thing that we can say about comfort zones, not only are they places we go to feel secure and things that we're good at, but there are people who we like to be around and feel good to be around. People we like to be around. People that give us compliments. People that we get along with. Hey, you know who our comfort zones are? Our spouses, our children, our family, our, our friends, our church members. Thank God for that. But you know what? What's the balance? If we're not careful, then we never want to get out of that comfort zone. It's harder to talk to a stranger once in a while, isn't it? It's hard to talk to a, a sinner who's not doing God's work and not in church with you. Here's where we get to, to this idea where comfort zones can be a real problem. We're not willing to get out of those. I was thinking in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he just passes through Jericho. And there's a little verse here that really struck me as, as, as applicable to this thought of John and the apostles. It says, And John answered and said, Master, this is Luke 9.49, We saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. Now, you remember Jesus' answer? I mean, I think John was saying that as if he was hoping for approval from Christ. Yeah, you're right. We don't allow that, John. You're right. Nobody can do anything if they're not on our team. You know what Jesus said? Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. You know what John got into? He got into his comfort zone. He was used to being around just him and the other apostles, the other crowds that followed. All of a sudden, they saw this guy. He didn't, they didn't know him from anything. And he's casting out demons and doing God's work in Jesus' name, and they don't even think he's a part of their group. He said, I forbid him. I stopped him from doing that, Lord. Isn't that good? The Lord said, no, that's not good. See, sometimes when we're not willing to get out of our comfort zones, it is not good. Same writer said about comfort zones, yes, it can be hard to leave our comfort zones, Fear keeps us frozen. But like anything, fear becomes a habit. It does. It becomes a habit. That's why we don't leave our comfort zones because there's a fear there. We like that comfortable place. Well, let me move on. So we, we kind of described, I hope you get this, what our comfort zones are. Now we've got to get further into this. Number two, why is it necessary to sometimes leave our, our comfort zones? Why is it necessary to sometimes leave our comfort zones? Well, first of all, number one, we can say this. Great things seldom happen without sacrifice and pain. I can say without getting out of your comfort zone, right? Think of the greatest example of one willing to get out of their comfort zone. Jesus Christ, the cross. You talk about one who's willing to die and completely get away from whatever comfort he might have enjoyed, whatever uh, humanity he might have, have kept to himself and enjoyed being in. He, he laid it all the line. The cross is the key example of one willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary. And so great things, friends, seldom happen if we're not willing to make sacrifices that cost us a lot cost us getting out of our comfort zones. 
You know, the early church that I read uh, much about from the book of Acts, the reason they were such a great church and literally turned the world upside down, had thousands of people saved, and, and it was growing, and the whole Christian faith blossomed after the first century. Those people knew how to get out of their comfort zones. They did. If there was any churches that ever did, it was those early churches. Seldom has anything happened, great happened in the world without sacrifice. I could give you so many examples of this. You just look at any person who's done great things in their life, and they'll tell you, it was not without sacrifice. It was not without pain and suffering and, and patience and perseverance. I've been reading the, the great uh, biography of William Wilberforce. Uh, he was perhaps the single greatest man who ever lived in the cause of ending slavery. He ended it in England, and then because of his influence, it would later be stopped in our own country, but it would take a civil war to finally do that. But if you study his life, he was a frail little old man, uh, not much. He was sickly most of his life, but he was a giant spiritually, a great spiritual giant, a saved man who loved the Lord. He was a great parliamentary speaker, and he led his whole country to first stop the slave trade and then to abolish slavery completely. But man, it took him 20 years. He was three days from his death, on his deathbed, before the abolition of slavery totally took place in England. He had stopped the slave trade about 10, 15 years earlier, but the actual abolition of slavery itself didn't happen until three days before his death. Many people think it was because of all he had to do to put his whole life into that cause that he died at a relatively younger age. He was a frail man. But I tell you, he made such an impact on the world. That's why we need to get out of our comfort zones because nothing great's going to happen without that. Number two, battles are fought and won outside of our comfort zones. Battles are fought and won outside of our comfort zones. Now, think of the opposite. If I was to tell you the opposite, what's the opposite of our comfort zone? A war zone. <laughs> Would that be a pretty good opposite? That's about as opposite as you can get. If you're in a war zone, you are, the, you are the antithesis of being in a comfort zone. You know when they're training soldiers, our friend John mentioned Vietnam. and It was a great story he gave about going home. But you know, if you know any soldiers, anything about the military and soldiers training, they prepare them by getting them out of their comfort zones. That's the only way they're going to be ready to win a battle, to fight in battle. My dad was in the Marines, told us about uh, boot camp. And, and all the crazy things they made them do in boot camp. You know what they're trying to do? Get them totally away from the comforts they were used to living with. Because you get on that foreign field, you go to Vietnam or Korea or wherever it is, you're not going to have those comforts any longer. See, if battles are fought and battles are won, it's by people who are willing and can adapt to getting out of their comfort zones. Our Lord was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights before the devil really came to him. He had no food or water. You talk about getting out of your comfort zones. No food or water, 40 days. And the first temptation, as you can imagine, the devil in his so-called wisdom, uh, he's, he's not dumb, he tempted him to turn those stones into bread. Right? Out of his comfort zone at maybe a weakest human moment that he could be. And yet he passed the test. He understood what it was to be outside of his comfort zones. Number three, I could say, another reason why it's necessary to sometimes get out of our comfort zones is God calls us. God leads us out of our comfort zones. Really, when you think this thing through, and let me give you a couple of thoughts here. I was thinking this through during the message, working it up this week. This is really where God majors. This is one of his greatest works he does is he gets us out of our comfort zones at different times and different levels of our lives. First of all, salvation itself, being saved, is taking you out of your comfort zone. That's what repentance is. When Jesus said, repent ye and believe the gospel, there's no repentance without dealing with your sins and being broken over your sins. That's getting out of your comfort zones. Getting out of doing and being involved in those things that you just did like second nature, but they were sinful and wicked and against God. He tells you to repent of them. That's beginning of getting out of our comfort zones, even to come to Christ. And then in service to the Lord, he tells us, hey, follow me, like he told the apostles. That demands surrender. Surrender to him, putting him first. Following him means I can't follow what I want to do. My dreams and my goals are secondary. His have to be first. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, he said. Hey, that's getting out of your comfort zone. Sanctification, the very process by which God is maturing us and making us more like His Son and making us holy. It demands suffering. There's nobody who's ever been made holy without suffering through that process. Probably the greatest example of a human being we can talk about that did this was the great Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians 12, in the end of verse 9, he said after asking God three times to take away the thorn in the, in the flesh that he had, he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The greatest man ever born of a woman was John the Baptist. That's Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus said that, right? Was there ever a man who, who lived without the comforts of this life like John the Baptist did? His life is an amazing lesson of living outside your comfort zone. At some point in his life, I've always been intrigued. I hope one day to sit down and talk with John for about a thousand years and talk to him about his life. So much we don't know. But at some point he went out in the wilderness. And the Bible says in just one climactic verse in Luke 180, And the child John grew and waxed or became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Wow. I don't know how long he was out there in the desert. But I'll tell you what, he wasn't comfortable. When they finally saw him on the scene, he was wearing camel skins, eating honey and wild, uh, wild honey and locust. I mean, you talk about, I bet he had hair all over him. He was a hairy man. He came out of nowhere. But I'll tell you, when he came, he literally turned his world upside down. People came out from everywhere to hear him preach. And he prepared the way of the Lord. Nothing great happens. And God calls people from their comfort zones for this reason. One other final thought to add, and this is so important to you and I. Do you know the only way you and I can learn certain lessons in the Christian life is going through suffering, getting out of our comfort zones. Isn't Job a lesson of that? Job teaches us that probably more than anybody else. Job, who, who went through that terrible trial of losing all he had and his ten children, losing his own health to the point of death, and yet without that, he couldn't have learned the lessons that he finally learns by the end of his book. You know, one of the reasons why this World War II generation, I don't, we don't have a whole lot of them left now, but uh, Brother Goldman was one of those who passed away not long ago, but you know why that World War II generation was so great? Because they learned how to live outside the comfort zones of life. My grandparents and great-grandparents went through not only World War II, but before that, the Great Depression. Learned to do without anything. Learned to do with very little comfort, creature comforts of life. And yet they became one of the greatest generations, perhaps, in the history of the world. All that they were able to do. Well, that brings me to number three. So talk about what are our comfort zones? Why is it necessary to sometimes... Leave our comfort zones. And number three now, our final point will be this. How do we get out of our comfort zones? How do we get out of our comfort zones? Well, first of all, number one, by realizing the benefits really do outweigh the cost involved. You, you're going to have to weigh this in your own thinking. It'll never happen until you really do this, this uh, scenario in your mind. You have to see that the benefits of getting out of your comfort zone outweigh the cost of staying in your comfort zone. And there is a cost. Every time we stay in comfort zones and avoid doing what we should do for Christ, we, what we should do in our family, our job, whatever, there's a price we're paying. Paul said it so beautifully in Philippians 3. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm forgetting all that other stuff. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. Paul saw the benefits 
of paying the price of getting out of his comfort zone to see what it would bring. The results outweighed the cost. And that's exactly the kind of mathematics, if you will, in the mind that each one of us have to do. When the great Abraham Lincoln was confronted with the horror of the possibility of sending thousands upon thousands of Union soldiers into battle against the Confederate States, he had to weigh the options. He had to say, am I willing to allow, and there would be 400,000 Union deaths versus around 200,000 Confederate deaths. But you know what? As, and he was receiving a lot of information and pressure and advice and counsel from people not to continue the war. And even in the, in the presidential election of 1864, if you ever want to study something amazing, uh, he was running for a second term. And in fact, he almost didn't get elected because his own party had turned away from him, many in that party, and said, we want somebody that's going to stop the war. They were tired of all the bloodshed and the carnage. But you know what he said? He said, I can't allow the comfort that we might have immediately from stopping the war and saving some more lives because the, the end result will be more costly than what these lives will cost. And that is the preservation of this great country that would not have been preserved if he had not continued in the conflict. Tell you what, every mother that's in this room right now knows this very well. The pain of you bearing a child is not greater than the joy of having that child. That's what made you do it. That what, that's what got you through it. And that's what we have to weigh in our minds. What are we going to get? What is going to be the result of leaving our comfort zone versus what it's going to cost us if we stay in our comfort zones? The writer I read from earlier said this in the end of his quote, figure out the worst that can happen. This is by getting out of your comfort zone. And the best that can happen, either you get out or you don't get out of your comfort zone, focus on the best things and it will be easier to escape that comfort zone. I think he's exactly right. Well, not only do we get out of our comfort zones by realizing the benefits outweigh the costs, but secondly and lastly, by remembering several things. And I have four points to add to this and they're very quick and easy. We've got to remember some things. If we're going to get out of our comfort zone, we have to remember, first of all, number one, our Lord has gone before us. Our Lord has gone before us. He set the example of leaving His comfort zone. And He is in that place where He wants us to go. See, I told you, He calls us, He, he urges us, he, he moves us into places that aren't comfortable and they're hard to think about going. And they're scary a bit. And we have fears about going there. But God's already there and He's calling us there. I love when it says that God said to Noah, Come thou and thy family into the ark. Genesis 7.1 He didn't say go into the ark. He said come into the ark because he was already there waiting. You talk about getting out of your comfort zones and go on a, an ark that would be afloat for 150 days and he wouldn't leave for 370 days, 75 days. Well, Jesus was the ultimate example of one Jesus said, it was said of Jesus, these, these words in Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And you've got to be doing that to get out of your comfort zone. You've got to be looking to Him. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him, He's telling us, consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Perfect application to us. He said, if you think it's hard to go deal with sinners and the persecution that sinners might bring to your life, think of him, consider him, who paid the ultimate price in shedding his own blood at the hands of sinners. He said, look to him. He's went on before us. Secondly, other Christians have and will go with us. Here's how you get out of your comfort zones. Realize other Christians have and still will. You won't be alone. It's amazing that the first verse of chapter 12 of Hebrews actually tells us this. Before we even get to verse 2 and 3, he says in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, I mean surrounded with, so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He says, you got this cloud of many spectators looking on. I, I think that cloud coming after chapter 11 with the hall of faith, if you will, is all those who were on before us and done such great things, all of which took people getting out of their comfort zones. Well, thirdly, we could just say this. Why should we get out of our comfort zones? How are we going to do it? Because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Sometimes it just comes down to weighing this in your mind. Hey, I've got to do it because it's right. We don't need tons of explanations. We don't need a psychological, sociological idea and, and, and understanding of everything. Sometimes you, say, you see what God has told us. We know we're to do it and we're to do it because it's right to do. We have to have that kind of determination. Remember Paul as he was in a meeting with the church at Ephesus in Miletum in verse, or chapter 20 of the book of Acts. Here's what he said. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Bound in the Spirit. Small s, not the Holy Spirit in my own spirit. He said, I'm bound, I'm, I'm determined. Unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save for except that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. <laughs> They're part of, they await me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In the next chapter in Acts 21, a man named Agabus comes and he has a prophecy to give to Paul. It's going to be a hard prophecy for the brethren to hear because they love Paul. And they hear that Paul is going to be arrested when he goes to Jerusalem. So they try to stop him from going. I want you to hear his reply in Acts 21, 12. And when he had heard these things, Paul, when we had heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. They said, hey, Agabus told us you're going to be arrested. Just don't go, Paul. We can't let you go, Paul. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. I'll tell you folks, sometimes you just have to get to the place where you just say, it's the right thing to do. You got to do it no matter what the cost involved. The Bible says of Jesus in Luke 9, 51, that he and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he set, steadfastly set his face to go up to Jerusalem. He knew what was waiting for him there, the cross. All the suffering and shame and agony. You know, I love to read biographies. And one of the reasons I love biographies, especially Christian biographies, is it, 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 it encourages me and it, it, it motivates me to realize so much has happened before me and so many people have paid such a price and they had that determination and that perseverance. And they were willing to leave whatever comfort zones they had to do great things for God. And that brings me to my last point of why and how we can do it. Because we can't ultimately fail. We cannot ultimately fail. You know, anybody can put up with a certain amount of suffering if they know it won't last forever. And they know something good's going to come of it. That's in our nature. Every one of us. If you have to do something hard, as long as you know there's an end to it, and you know it's going to be great when you get to the end, all of us can put up with a lot. And you know what we need to remember? Getting out of our comfort zones is, hey, we can't fail ultimately. No matter what happens, no matter how much pain we endure, how much suffering, how much abandonment, in the end, God is going to bring us to victory. He's going to bless and reward us. If we know it's going to cease and the reward will come, then we just got to plug on and do it. How do those martyrs do it? How did all those millions of martyrs whose stories are just thrilling and just unbelievable, how'd they do it? You know how they did it? They knew that it wouldn't last forever. The flames would only last so long and their spirit would leave their body. That drowning would only be so long before they went to be with the Lord. And so they did it. Now, Worst case scenario. Let me give you worst case scenario about our mission. Out of our fortress on a mission. Here's the worst case scenario. 
even if you and I get to the point where we think we have failed in this mission. And that will be up to your conclusion and mine. That will be an opinionated conclusion. But you know what I can tell you? I can guarantee you this. No matter how much we might think we have failed, we will not have failed. No matter what the numbers, no matter what the changes, here's why I know we won't fail. Because along the way, the things that we will be doing, God will be seeing. He will hear the prayers we pray. He'll know the effort we make. He'll see the sacrifices we're going to make and have to make. And He will surely reward us in the end, no matter what outward accomplishments we think will come. Paul said it this way. He said in Romans 8 and 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Now he starts it this way. He says, hey, we're joint heirs with Christ. If so be, you've got to remember you're a joint heir with Christ, because of what he says now, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall, shall be revealed in us. Let me end on a good note. I want to end with a balance, okay? I've entitled the message, Getting Out of Our Comfort Zones, but I didn't entitle the message, Staying Out of Our Comfort Zones. Aren't you glad that even when God leads us out of our comfort zones, He doesn't make us stay in those places all the time? It's not going to be forever, and it won't even be long periods of time in this life. Aren't you glad for the oasises of life that even in the midst of leaving some of your comfort zones and my comfort zones, God will let us come back to family, let us come back to enjoying church and friends, and we'll have the beautiful warmth of God's presence even as we go out on a mission and give up our comfort zones Realizing that one day, ultimately, we're going to be more than comfortable when we sit with the Lord in His new kingdom. In heaven now and on earth to be, we're going to live with the Lord forever. I challenge you, consider your comforts. Consider how you can get out of those comforts and how God will use you when you do. Let's pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.